My name is Hero, and here is my story. It all started one morning on my way to work. I was lying in my bed. I just woke up and I was doing some light stretches. I sleepily look at the alarm clock. The digital alarm read 8.15 a.m. I jolt out from my bed, just realizing I'm seriously late for work, so I take a taxi. As I look out the window of the taxi and see the city whiz by, my thoughts go to Akame, my girlfriend of four years. Akame was a fitness instructor who took gym sessions for older clients at the city center every weekday. She must have gotten up early to make her morning session. On that fateful morning, my taxi driver took a route that passed the city center building. Perhaps, if he didn't, I wouldn't have seen what started this whole drama. Perhaps, if I had just woken up early and took the train like I'd done every other morning, I'd be having a nice time now. But I did see, and that moment changed everything. It had seemed to happen so fast. One moment, we were approaching the city center, and I was taking in the breathtaking view of the city. The next, I was seeing her. Akame. My lovely and beautiful girlfriend, Akame. Standing outside of the building with a very tall and handsome man. It was the way they were standing, so close to each other. There was something intimate about it that, at the moment, seemed as sinful as blasphemy. Akami's eyes were sparkling as she was laughing at something the tall man had said. I looked on, at first surprised, but then enraged. And I just continued to look at their direction, even after they got out of my view. At that moment, I felt a bitterness rise up from the depths of my stomach. I felt it go up my gut and settle in my tongue. My girlfriend of four long years, Akame Mitsubishi, was cheating on me. We were eating dinner at the dining table. Sitting opposite each other, Akame appeared to be chatting excitedly about her day, although her actual words are droned out because she notices me being deep in thought. Much as I tried, I couldn't get the thought out of my head. All I could think about was her radiance as she laughed <laughs> with him. Her laughter had been so true and so free. I couldn't remember when she last laughed at something I said in that way. To be honest, we didn't laugh a lot anymore. She had laughed because of that man. That man. The thought of him alone was what was troubling me. I couldn't bear to think that she was cheating and yet pretending to be in love with me. Maybe she loved both of us. I couldn't share Akame with another man. No. We'd been through so much and I loved her too much. I was unconsciously squeezing my wine glass then with so much power that it suddenly burst from the pressure, sending shards of glass into my palm. <sighs> what the? Hiro, are you okay? Uh, I'm, I'm fine. I was just lost in thought. I wince as I pick the shards that had pierced my palm. Akame grabbed my hand and she tried to help me. What are you thinking about? Are you sure you're okay? You've been really off since you got back from work. I'm fine. I'm just thinking about the things I've got to take care of. I had to find out who he was. I had to know the name of my girlfriend's other man. 
At midnight, I wake up and touch Akame to see if she's still awake. She, however, doesn't budge. Stealthily, I stretch over her and reach for her phone. I input her password and begin to go through her messages. I search for a while, but find nothing. I had to think about what I was doing. Of course, she was not going to leave her messages with another man in plain view for me to see. I'd have to approach the problem from another perspective. His perspective. Next day, I'm standing across the building, waiting for the tall man I've seen with Kame the other day. I'm on a bench, pretending to read a newspaper while waiting for that man to show up. At that time, it felt like it was a good idea to confront this man. I just couldn't bear the thought of them together. I couldn't think of anything else. The tall man exits the building with an elderly woman by his side. I cross the street and I walk towards him. Hey man, can I help you sir? What are you doing with my girlfriend? Sorry? What are you talking about? Don't even do that. Don't bother playing dumb. I saw you two yesterday. All giggly and lovey-dovey. I don't know what you're talking about. If you don't mind, I'd like to take my grandmother home. She shouldn't be standing for too long outside. You think you're so smooth, don't you? Look, man, I really don't know you, and I don't have a clue what you are going on about. I'll take my leave now, and if you don't want any trouble... Don't attempt to stop me. Again, he tries to leave. Again, I stop him. Just as we're about to get into it, Akame comes out of the building. She sees what's going on and makes an attempt to stop the fight. What is going on here? Hello? Uh, Mr. Yoshida. You know this man, Akame? He just attacked me, claiming I'm having something with his girlfriend... And he won't even let me be on my way. What? Hero? What's going on? Come on. Don't pretend. I saw you guys yesterday when I was on my way to work. I know you are cheating on me. I saw you guys standing out there, laughing. Right there. Hero, what on earth are you talking about? This is Mr. Yoshida. He's the grandson of one of my clients, Mr. Sakamoto. He was here yesterday to pick up her favorite sweater, which she had forgotten. I... I know what I saw. You guys were laughing and being all cute. Can you hear yourself? Have you lost your mind, Hero? You've literally accosted a stranger because I was laughing with him? How is that okay? Mr. Yoshida, I'm really sorry for everything. I don't know what has gotten into my boyfriend. It's alright. We'll be on our way now. It's certainly getting too cold for Grandma. Now, if you'll excuse me. <laughs> yes, please. See you tomorrow, Mr. Sakamoto. Hero, what you've just done is not okay. And I'm very disappointed and sad about it. And so, Akame just walked away. After that little incident, I tried my best to be a good boyfriend and not screw things up any more than they already have. But in the end, it just didn't work out, and we ended things eventually. Interestingly, Akame started seeing that Mr. Yoshida after we broke up. They may not have known it at the time, but it turns out I had a cause to be jealous. I'd seen the spark between them, even before they did. And, as for me, 
I'm fine. Just ticking things slowly, trying not to jump into anything, jump to any conclusions. I, I'd learned that the hard way. Excuse me. Excuse me. I'm really, really sorry to bother you like this and selfishly take time out of your schedule. I'm sure you must have so many things to do and so many places to go, but, um, y yes? Oh, um, it, it's me again. That stray Neko that you always give food to. And thanks again, by the way. I know I always thank you so much anytime you give me so much as a chicken bone, but I really just cannot thank you enough. So, um, thanks again. Th that aside, there's something I wanted to ask you about. I know I don't really have a right to approach you like this. I mean, you have always done so much for me, and I have never done anything for you. So, it's really not my place to ask you for something. That being said, I was hoping you would consider adopting me. N now, hear me out. This isn't just about me. I'll never make this just about me. There's something in this for you too. I, I promise. You see? The other day, you were on your normal morning route and I was watching you. W well, I hope you don't think it's too weird or mine too much. There's not exactly a lot of things for a penniless stray like me to do. But, um, while I was watching, I overheard you say something that really st struck a chord with me. You said something along the lines of, I wish I had someone to give me lots of love. Now, I hope it's not too presumptuous of me to say this, but I really love you. And I mean, I really, really love you. So, if I may be so arrogant, I'd say I'm just the nigga for you. I can give you lots and lots of love. I mean, it comes so naturally to me. So, would you consider adopting me? I, I mean, there's no way I couldn't love you. You're like catnip to me. You're the only warm I ever even have in this world. All the others, they look at me like they just stepped in shit. I think maybe it's because I'm one of my ears spitting. I guess it does look rather ugly. And it might be affected. Even the other strays give me the same look. I'd have thought so at least they would give me sympathy. We're all in the same boat after all. But I guess something is wrong with me. Maybe it's not even my ear. But 
But if there's even one thing right about me, it's how much I love you. I love you so much, I promise. I'll move heaven and earth to express it. I'll give you all the love you could ever dreamed of. More, even. Like, uh, oh, I know. I'll, I'll tell you I love you a thousand times a day, at least. I'll even count, or until my voice goes out. Don't believe me? Here. Guess that right now. Look, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love... Huh. You want me to stop? Are... Are you sure? I can do it far longer. Oh. For my own good? Well... Okay. If... If you insist... I'll... Stop. I... Hope you didn't want me to stop just... Because you found my voice annoying. But... Um... If you did... That's okay. For instance, if, if if you find me annoying, I can just stay silent forever. Or only speak when spoken to. So if you'll adopt me, I can just stay in the corner of your room. And I'll make a peep. I'll be like I'm not even there. Until you want me to be there, of course. Even when I'm silent, there are all st still many ways I can offer you love. I can bow down to you, and not just on one knee or something like that. The whole deal. Forehead to the floor. Every morning when you wake up, you'll see me bowing down to you. And when you want to go to sleep for the night, I'll wish you goodnight by bowing down to you as well. It's really not a big deal for me. I love you so much. I know when a stray like me really shouldn't be so damn cocky, but I don't think there's another Nick out there that would go to such lengths for you. Because no one loves you as much as I do. It's obvious I would love you this much. You're the only one who has ever done anything for me. I mean, this is the only conversation I've had in forever. And I've been so starved for some chit-chat. You're the only one who ever talks to me. Unless you can't expression of disgust is talk. In which case, yeah. Lots of people talk to me. I... I don't have any family or friends to talk to. Even the other strays, the one group who should at least give me the time of the day, don't want anything to do with me. What? Is it because I'm a different breed? I don't know. I just don't know. But that doesn't matter. Because at least you acknowledge me. I know I said this so many times already, but I really do love you. But I don't just love you. I can be helpful, too. I'm sure you don't want a burden to haul around after a while. But I won't be a burden. I can keep you warm. If you don't mind me in your bed. I know you always shiver on cold nights. 
I was seen from your window. You can hold me for warmth and as tightly as you want. Even if you constrict me, I will make a fuss. No matter what you do to me, I won't make a fuss. I'd do anything for you. After all, I love you. And there's so many reasons to love you. For instance, this sweater you gave me, what I'm wearing now, is my most prized possession. Well, my only possession, really. Another stray tried to take it from me. I wouldn't have any of that. It's the only thing I have of you, after all. It's my quarter face. Until it was mauled beyond recognition. Oh, uh, you don't mind if I have claws, do you? I mean, it's completely understandable if you don't want to keep a nickel that still have their claws. You, you can declaw me if you want. I know how very, very cool declawing is, but it's not a problem for me. If, if that's what you want. Like I said, I'd do anything for you. Because I love you. I'm sure you can use me in some way. Let me think. I don't have any money. But I can still give you presents. Every day. I can leave you the head of a mouse who dare to trespass on your precious property, assuming they are and even have the audacity. Anyway, I'd love to do that for you. I love you. You know, I know that at most, I'm just a footnote in your life, but my life revolves around you. All my dreams are about you. And when my stomach doesn't hurt too much, and it isn't too cold, and I have the luxury of thinking about less painful things, my thoughts are always about you. My fantasy. to see I have? Uh, well, sometimes you would leave your window unlocked, you know? And I flirted with the idea that maybe you left it like that for me. That you were inviting me. Then I would be able to just walk right in and snuggle into your bed then with your body heat against me I wouldn't be so cold or sometimes I thought about what it would be like if I was a human maybe you would like me more maybe I could be a natural part of your home Or, even if I'm still a nickel oftentimes, when I went to sleep starving, I had fantasies. Where I wake up in your home, in your arms, to you petting me, your laps was always warm and cozy. And then you'd have a nice meal laid out for us. For the both of us to enjoy. Sometimes I fantasize that I'd be the one feeding you. 
other times that you be the one feeding me. You'd always congratulate me for finishing all my food. Like such a cute little neko. And then you cuddled me as a reward. But I shouldn't be so entitled. It's just a fantasy. I would never ask so much from you. Like I said before, I'd never be a burden. I'll earn my keep. If, if you take me, I can cook and clean like a maid. I can be your obedient little neko maid. You can even... Make me wear the outfit. And I can do other simple tasks too. Like, cut your hair. And keep the leftover hair in my collection. <laughs> As for, for food, I can just subsist off any invasive mice. Like I said before, you don't have to waste your money feeding me. So, you will take me. Won't you, Master? Oh, I'm so sorry. I called you Master without thinking. Can I? Can I call you Master? As for me, you can call me whatever you want. You can even... Call me it, and I'll just be glad you even call me. I don't even have a name. Like I said, no one even knows I exist until I was implicitly remind them. So there's no one to call it. So you can give me whatever name you want. I won't refuse. I want to be your property after all. I am your property. So, you will take me, won't you? I promise, I swear on everything that is holy, that I will be a good little kitten. So, can I? Can I be yours? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I'd kiss your feet, but I have no idea if you'd be disgusted. I promise you, you won't regret this. I'll always listen and I'll always obey. And I'll always be yours. I won't let an hour pass without letting you know just how much I love you. And you really have no idea. Just how much I love you. You're finally giving me a home. A place where I belong. If only I can see the look on the faces of those stupid other strays. I am finally getting my happy end. While they are still stuck out in the freezing cold. But that doesn't matter anymore. No one else matters. You're the only one that matters. Because you're the only one that I will ever love. <laughs> and I'll never let you forget it. Excuse me, could you turn around and face me? I have something I'd like to say to you. Oh, you don't have to scream. I don't mean you any harm. You're safe with me. I know what it looks like, well... 
I know what I look like. It's not every day you see an angel, right? For humans like you, anyway. Look at these wings. I really am an angel. Well, I know my wings are stained black. I can understand why that would seem alarming. But I really am an angel. You told me yourself, remember? You called me an angel. You're an angel. All because of some token kindness on my end. That was really quite heavenly of you. I was in the form of a human at that time. I take that form from time to time. It's just so hard feeling like an angel, you know? Nothing's ever good enough. No prayer is pious enough. No charity is generous enough. No love is deep enough. So, it's impossible to really feel like an angel. At least I never really felt like one. That's why I take on a human form so often. It makes me feel less ashamed. When I pretend to be human, it makes me feel less like a failure of an angel. <clears throat> There's a lot to make me feel like a failure of an angel. I'd always stutter when saying my prayers. I'd always forget the exact wording or mispronounce them. I don't know how normal I sound to you, but I actually have a bit of an accent in my language. Uh, the language of the angels. The other angels would laugh at me, at best, hit me, at worst. Often they would get angry at me, they would yell, they would shout. I'd cover my ears, but I could still hear them. The bleeding of my ears upon my hands, reminding me that everyone knows what a screw-up I am. But not you. You don't think I'm a screw-up. You called me an angel. I even disagreed, but you insisted I was an angel. Again and again I disagreed, and again and again you insisted that I was an angel. Me, a real angel. You're a bit of an angel yourself. You should tell me how you're hiding your wings. I'd love to. But not only did you call me an angel, which I love, by the way. Please, do it more. Come on, call me an angel. You're an angel. Oh, that's great. That's the stuff. Come, one more time, please. You're an angel. Yes, there we go. I just cannot get enough of that. I really want to ask for more, but I don't want to be a burden on you. Seriously, if I didn't restrain myself, we'd be here all day, until Judgment Day. Maybe I can just get a recording of you calling me an angel, and then play it on repeat for myself. By which I mean I already did. You're an angel. You're an angel. You're an angel. I hope you don't mind. Now, where was I? I was sure I had a point here somewhere that wasn't just me fawning over you. Oh, right. Like I was saying, not only did you call me an angel, but you helped me be one. You know, you really motivated me to be an angel. A real angel. Part of our job is looking over humans. I never cared much about that, though. Humans remind me too much of angels. But not you, though. You, you're perfect. A real angel. At least the way an angel should be. 
why you made my job so easy for me. It was always a joy for me to look after you. Killing every stinking, filthy demon that breathed in your zip code. All in the name of keeping you safe. Or, of course, it wasn't my job to be your personal guardian angel. That honor wasn't bestowed upon me, but I like to think that I took that title up myself. So, please, I'd love it to see if you could think of me as your own personal guardian. After all, I did so much to protect you. Not just from demons, but from humans, too. You see, I know a bit about human loves you. I've watched them all this time, after all, in terror from up in heaven. I know the horrors and atrocities they can commit. And I know the lies they can tell. Worst of all of them, to me, is when they tell you they love they you, love you, they love you. Which is why I wanted to protect you from such humans, to spare you the venom spewing from their lips. And that mission started in heaven. You see, there's this angel. He has these arrows with the names of humans on them. When he shoots a human, they fall in love with the human of the name on the arrow. I'm using the term in love very liberally, because you know how superficial human love can be. I believe you might know this angel as Cupid. Anyways, his job is to make humans fall in love. Naturally, I couldn't have that. I couldn't have you artificially falling in love with someone and the fake, worthless, spineless affection. I had to save you. And so I did. I watched Cupid. I watched and watched for hours, then days, weeks, until finally he stepped away from his quiver. Who's the failure of an angel now, huh? I ran to the quiver. I never knew for sure angels had hearts until mine was pounding at my chest, as it was then. I pulled the arrow out rapidly, one by one. Frantically looking for the one with your name, but I couldn't find it, and I panicked. Cupid could return at any moment and discover my actions against him and heaven. So, I took the arrow out by the bushel, snapping them in two over my knee. Many would be lost as collateral damage, of course. But that is more than a suitable price to pay for you. It's 
It's not like there was one with my name in there anyways. The arrows are for humans. Of course, Cupid caught me, but it was too late for him. My eye met his just as I broke the last bushel over my knee. The look of agony and terror on his face, it was priceless. It reminded me of me. He froze up like a deer in the headlights. Time stopped for what seemed like ages. Until my laughter broke the silence. Yes, I laughed. How could I not? I won, of course. When he finally gathered up some semblance of composure, he flew away with utmost haste to warn the others of my treachery. I would imagine, of course. I couldn't have that, nor could I. I chased him down. He had barely taken off when I grabbed him by the neck. In the moment, I could only think of how to ensure he couldn't get to the others to warn them. And then, it dawned on me. Such a divine revelation dawned on me. With a slash of my hands, I cut off his wings. He cried and cried. No more was he much of an angel without his wings. It really was quite poetic to see him cower at his feet. Like I cowered at the feet of all those angels who beat me and laughed at me. I asked him a simple question. Who's worthless now? Now who's pathetic and debased and unloved? All he could do was stutter like me in prayer. Of course, my job wasn't done. Without his wings, he couldn't fly to tell the other. But as long as he was in heaven, he could still walk to them and tell them. So, I shoved him over the edge of heaven and down to earth. It was exhilarating. To see him literally fall from heaven, to be a fallen angel. It's what others used to call me, fallen angel. But still, the beating of my heart could not leave me alone. I had worried that perhaps an angel might look down at the earth. That perhaps they might see Cupid, the sobbing mess that he was, and perhaps they might tell. So I dug a hole, a deep, deep, deep hole, that when filled would have too much dirt for even an angel to lift. And I tossed Cupid down there and buried him beneath my feet. Finally, he was truly beneath me. Though, as I was burying him, I had noticed that my wings had become tainted black. And then, no matter how I beat them, I could not take off. So I am unable to fly back to heaven. Oh well, I thought. I know what I am. Who cares if I can't make it back to heaven? Heaven is where you are. And that brings me here to you. Now that you know what I've done for you. You, you know just how good of an angel I am for you. I am your one and only personal guardian angel. 
utterly devoted, bar nothing. No one protects you like me. No one cares for you like me. No one will truly love you like I do. Especially not any human. I don't think any human has fallen from heaven just for you. I don't think any human chased down an angel and clipped his wings just for you. Buried him just for you. So, what do you say? Will you accept me as your guardian angel? As your guardian angel? As your guardian angel? your off day. Carly, what'd you do all day? Oh, what'd you get there? Yeah, I don't, man, I don't really like I out. No. I was at work till two, so I could have come to all this. I mean, I would have liked to spend time with you, but I guess it's okay. So, I, oh, you played frisbee. <laughs> I love frisbee. What are you talking about? Yeah, I love frisbee. Oh, y'all played. Y'all played ultimate. Oh, you. Ah, oh, you could have invited me. Yeah, I mean. 
mean, sometimes we get into arguments, but, like, I like hanging with the group. I don't understand why you wouldn't have liked me to come. That's cool. Jesse was there. Really? You didn't tell me Jesse was gonna be there. <sighs> so why are you being so secretive? What's what's so what's so different about Jesse than like Tina or Greg? still like to come. Man, it just seems like you hang out with Jesse more than you hang out with me. It's a little bit frustrating. I mean, 
sure to like all of yours. No, don't give me that. I know. Whatever. I'm not mad. I'm not mad. I'm just a little frustrated. I don't understand. the last summer before finishing high school. It was a hot summer, long and boring. I was never a popular boy in school. I used to hang out with my one and only friend, Oki, just a nerd like myself. We listened to hip-hop, smoked joints, and imagined what life would be like at the university far from this town away from all of this dust and boredom. And that's how the summer afternoons passed, until a shadow appeared. My father used to play in a group called Cobra with some of his friends in the afternoon. They basically played wedding music, but they really had some good time with it. Oki and I were listening to them in the back of the garage where they used to practice. One day, a girl with straight black hair appeared looking for her father. I suddenly got a little nervous, and Oki as well, since a girl like that was not in our usual spheres. In the end, we found out that her father was the drummer in my father's group. We both secretly dreamed about her and wanted to find out who she was and what high school she went to. Eventually, a friend of Oki found out that she was at the same school as us and her classroom was in the other wing of the building. Her name was Himari. Wow. Cool. Himari. Of course, we spent the rest of the summer dreaming of her. We wouldn't recognize it, though. When we finally went back to school in September, I started following her, watching her have breakfast with her friends, listening to her laugh from the distance, imagining Himari, the girl I've always dreamed of being my girlfriend, going to the beach together, eating ice cream, kissing. However, I stayed in the background. She would never date a loser like me. Neither like Oki, too. <laughs> it was another afternoon at my father's place that she popped up again. With her school uniform and her long hair and a ponytail, she was looking more gorgeous than ever. She just stayed around waiting for her father, so we ended up talking. Ah, <sighs> Himari... 
how beautiful you are, and look at me, I'm just a loser. I couldn't stop thinking about it while she kept smiling at me. But losers can get lucky sometimes, and although I truly don't know what she saw in me, maybe it was boredom, or maybe she had no better choice at the moment, we started dating somehow. In the beginning, it was euphoric. I couldn't even believe how I could ever be so lucky. I just kept asking myself that. How are you so lucky, bro? The slightly jealous Oki kept asking me the same question. Imari and I were truly united, and with time, we became inseparable. Until one day, when things started to change, and she turned into a shadow. My shadow. She suddenly didn't like me hanging out with my best friend, Oki, who, according to her, was a nerd, a bad influence, and toxic. He is my best and only friend, I said to her, but she got really angry at me. Those beautiful green eyes looked at me in a way that scared me so much. So I just dropped the topic. Nor did she want me to go out alone just in case something happened to me. So we spent every afternoon at her house watching anime on the couch. It was good at first, cozy and romantic, but I got bored after a while. So during the anime couch sessions, I would chat with Oki on Facebook. As soon as she realized this, Himari became my digital shadow, too. I got my phone confiscated for the afternoon, and I couldn't even give a like without her permission. And if I was not at her house right after school, she would message me, Where are you, my love? My dear Enkai, when are you coming? One day I arrived five minutes later, and I found her almost crying. She told me that she could not live without me, and that if one day I would leave her, she was going to do something very, very serious with herself. And she rolled up her sleeves. I thought that I loved her, and that I was the luckiest nerd for having her by my side. That it was a miracle that such a beautiful and popular girl like Himari would go out with a loser like me until this very moment. Suddenly, I realized that holding on to a girl like this, no matter how beautiful and popular she was, was making me even more of a loser, if that was even possible. After all, I had no life. I no longer had any friends ever since I met her. It was me on the couch at her house, in prison, watching anime to infinity. I got so scared that I just ran away. I ran home and hid in my room that I shared with my sister, Nico. I felt safe with her since she was the oldest. Tormented as I was, I couldn't go to sleep. At midnight, I went down to the kitchen for a bottle of water, and there she was. Himari, she was quietly sitting on the couch of my parents' living room, watching anime on their iPad. Like a doll. Like Annabelle. Oh my gosh. I was waiting for you, she told me. I almost had a breakdown, so I just ran back to my bedroom. Yeah, so brave, I know. It was my sister, Nico, who kicked her out eventually. That very night, I sent her a message that I did not want to be with her anymore. That I did not want her to get close to me in any way, and that she sh should stay away from my house, my friends, or anything mine. The next day at school, I saw her down the hall. And she didn't say anything. She wouldn't even look at me, but as she passed... She would push me down to the floor. 
she couldn't do more as such a popular girl couldn't just humiliate herself in front of everyone. Apparently, she got on with her life. I had to block her on Facebook, Instagram, and all over social media because she kept on harassing and threatening me for a while. In real life, she would never say anything to me. She wouldn't even approach. As for me, I must admit I was a little scared at first. But finally, I was able to go back to my good old loser life as it used to be. And now, I was a free loser. Oh.